Okay, without any further ado, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Joan Roughgarden. She is a researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii, and she is a professor emeritus at Stanford University's Department of Biology. She received her PhD in biology from Harvard University before starting a faculty position at Stanford University, where she founded and directed the Earth Systems Program and served as a professor of biology until 2011. Her research has focused on evolutionary ecology, specifically on evolutionary adaptations to changing environments and community ecology theory. She is the author of nine books and the recipient of several awards, including the Dinkelspiel Award in Undergraduate Teaching and the Guggenheim Fellowship. She has served on numerous national scientific advisory boards, steering committees, and grant review panels. And over the course of her career, she has mentored more than 30 students and postdocs. Her current work is focused on evolution of the hollow biome, and today she will be giving a talk entitled Hollow Biomes Evolution, Population Genetic Theory for the Hollow Genome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kayla, and uh, uh, thank you for all the effort you've put into uh, organizing this seminar. I know this, these are never easy to put together, and uh, I'm honored that, that you've done so. So I'd, I'd like to speak uh, with you all today about uh, the subject of how holobionts evolve and, in, and to focus particularly on the population genetic theory for the hologenome. And uh, the definitions here are that a microbiome is an ecological community of commensal and symbiotic and pathogenic microorganisms that share the body space of a host. And I love this definition. It's due to Letterberg and McRae. Then a holobiont is a composite organism consisting of the host together with its microbiome. And this traces to Lynn Margulis in 1991. And then the hologenome is the union of all the host genes with all the genes in the microbiome. And Elena Zilber Rosenberg and Jean Rosenberg uh, have introduced and, and uh, are proponents of, of this concept. And in addition, uh, I've introduced the term the hologenotype to represent, to, to refer to the configuration of the hologenome in an individual holobiont. And then Holobiont selection is the differential reproduction and or survival of holobionts, depending on their hologenotypes. Now, the discussion of uh, holobiont evolution uh, begins uh, with some controversy. And um, there are, in effect, two schools of thought on this. And the question is whether the holobiont that is, as I say, the union of the host with its microbiome, is, is itself a unit of evolution. And at the risk of oversimplifying somewhat, there, there are, in, in, in effect, two camps or two schools on this matter. One group says, yes, the holobiont is a unit of evolution. And this starts with Lynn Margulis and includes Scott Gilbert and Elena Zilber Rosenberg and Eugene and some other folks as well whom you may know. On the other side, uh, there are folks who don't think that the holobiont can be a unit of evolution. And these would include Nancy Moran in particular, Ford Doolittle, and others that are mentioned here. And why would there be a disagreement on this matter? And it revolves primarily around the matter of the mode of transmission vertical transmission versus horizontal transmission of the microbiome. And the early work, the early discussion, you might say, uh, on holobionts, holobiont evolution has tended to focus, it tended to emphasize vertical transmission so that the microbes from one generation to the next are transmitted from parent directly to offspring. Now, not in the gametes necessarily, but uh, but in the nearby environment. So example, the microbiome in a bird's nest could transmit, it could be the vehicle by which the parent transmits uh, 
her his or her microbiome to the to the hatchlings and similarly um, during birth for, for mammals during birth as the embryo passes down the birth canal there can be a vertical transmission of the microbiome from the mother to to the uh, to the offspring now um, however the the critics of the idea of the holobiont as a unit of evolution have stressed um, that in fact most microbes uh, uh, move from from parent to host and or, or from parent to offspring and from from host to host horizontally through widespread uh, passage in, in the environment. And for example, I, I've tended to focus on corals. And with corals, uh, uh, most of the zooxanthellae uh, are picked up from the surrounding seawater and the seawater uh, extends very far. And there, there are just a very few taxa in which there's vertical transmission of zooxanthellae. And, and the absence of vertical transmission uh, has led the critics to suppose that you can't have a holobiont serving as a unit of evolution because there's no inheritance. And that would seem simple enough. It could just rule it out. Now, Scott Gilbert over here uh, has been particularly uh, eloquent in demonstrating how much cooperation there actually, actually occurs and how much co-adaptation occurs between the host and its microbiome. And he's doc he and and others have documented uh, a, a huge degree of uh, uh, phenotypic integration between the microbiome and and its host, and so this this truly monumental degree of uh, uh, host microbiome synergism uh, has to be explained somehow, and um, the. Uh, proponents of the holobiont idea uh, suggest that it's holobiont selection on the combined host microbial genome by analogy to ordinary natural selection, whereas the critics argue that the evolution results from coevolutionary selection on separate host and microbial genomes, so that the kind of coevolution that occurs between a plant and its pollinator uh, would be the kind of coevolution that they envision would also explain the evolution that occurs between the, the, the cooperation that occurs between the host and its microbiome. Now, what's the difference here? One, one of the key things is that coevolutionary selection is different from holobiont selection. And it's been hard to uh, explain this, but hopefully this diagram will help. Now, in coevolutionary selection, you have, for example, two species right here. This would be a species, and this is its gene frequency and population size. And a theory of evolution would explain, would predict uh, what the gene pool and population size is at time t to t plus 1. So it would map time t into t plus 1. And there would be a fitness to the individuals here, which depends on the gene frequency, its gene frequency, its population size, and the gene frequency and population size in the other species. Like this could be the pollinator and this could be the plant. And it also has a gene pool and it and their fitnesses for the plant individuals, just as their fitnesses for the pollinators up here. And they depend on each other's properties so that we're getting a pair of coupled simultaneous equations that are predicting the gene pool of both species as separate gene pools uh, going from time t to t plus 1. And the equations are coupled. Now, uh, and it's a single level uh, system here. Now, holobiont selection, on the other hand, is a multi-level setup where you have a, an, in, an encasing host and you have uh, a, a microbe, and um, and you go from a dis from what I'm turning a, a 
set of hologenotypes. So these would be the gene frequencies for ordinary coevolutionary selection. The counterpart here would be the hologenotypes uh, for the holobiont at time t. And these are being mapped to a distribution of hologenotypes at time t plus one. And there are two kinds of fitnesses involved, the fitness of the host, which would be fairly conventional, the, and the fitness of the microbes. And the microbes have a fitness which represents their within host success times the host's success. So I'll be referring to this later as a multi-level fitness, the analog for holobiont selection of the inclusive fitness for um, uh, kin selection. So it's a different setup altogether. And they're not really alternatives to one another because they're different conceptualizations of what, pro of what the process is. And, uh, and so what is a hologenotype? Now, a hologenotype is a hierarchical data structure right here. And so this would represent a holobiont right here. For example, one, one coral individual. This would be another coral individual right here. And the genes within it, that is the hologenome, consists of the genes within the nucleus right here, and then genes in uh, various kinds of symbionts and microbes that are inside right here. And you'd represent, and you see it's hierarchical in this sense that you have, uh, uh, in this case, uh, six genomes all together, and and you can specify what they are in, in a, this kind of nested sense. And this is the way you'd represent it in a uh, in a modeling sense as a nested as a uh, a nested set of lists, lists within lists within lists. So the objective then of a theory of holobiont selection is to explain uh, the distribution of hologenotypes through time. And so what I did was to look into whether holobiont evolution was fatally flawed uh, with horizontal transmission. So you could it would be fairly straightforward to work it out with vertical transmission, but the question really is whether it also happens with horizontal transmission. So I set up two alternative models for holobiont evolution, uh, one with microbial mixing, uh, I mean, one with vertical transmission and one with horizontal transmission. So here's the life cycle for um, a, a vertical, transmission case. So we, we start with, we can start here. Uh, we start with some uh, juvenile or uh, 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 initial hosts, and they have a dis different distribution of microbes, microbe numbers within them. So here there's going to be selection on micro number, not, not not the strain identity, which we'll get to later. I mean, to begin with, uh, uh, two, two hologenotypes are different from one another if the number of microbes within them are different. And microbe number is equivalent to gene copy number and it is kind of the counterpart of uh, gene amplification. So here's, uh, these are hosts right here with one, two, five, up to four uh, cells. And then, then there's microbial uh, proliferation within the host. So, so each one increases by a bit. And then we come over to the next stage where there's holobiont selection. So here's where the holobiont as a whole reproduces and with vertical transmission. So the assumption in this particular illustration is where the, holo is where the microbes are. Um, uh, mutualistic, so that's why I have them in green. So the, the alternative case is where they're uh, uh, parasitic, and and I've worked that case out too in the papers. But let's look at this. And so here the supposition is that a host with lots of microbes in it produces lots of offspring, and 
and less so uh, with a fewer number of microbes. And with vertical transmission, the assumption is that the microbe, the microbiome uh, configuration of the offspring is ex exactly is the same as that of the parents. So the microbiome composition is transmitted uh, vertically. After that, then uh, there's a slight degree of migration between these. So these, uh, 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 each of these hosts releases a tiny amount of uh, um, their microbiome to a transfer pool, which then uh, is redistributed among all the uh, hosts. The reason for that is that without any transmission, with, without any horizontal transmission at all, the whole system break, reduces to clone selection. On the other hand, uh, with horizontal transmission, we have the same sort of setup here that there's microbial part proliferation within the host. Then we have the hosts. But now the hosts release their all of their microbes to a microbial source pool out in the ocean. And the ones, the hosts with lots of microbes release uh, lots of microbes uh, into the source pool. And they also release lots of uh, empty juvenile hosts. Then all, this array of empty juvenile hosts are colonized through Poisson sampling from the microbial source pool. And then the, the uh, system starts all, the life cycle starts all over again. So um, what happens? Uh, do we get selection in favor of an increased number of uh, uh, mutualistic microbes in one or the other or both of these setups? And it turns out that we get uh, an increased, uh, we have selection for increased number of microbes in both cases. The details are slightly different, but the outcome is, is pretty much the same. So these are graphs right here through time of the distribution of hologenotype frequencies. So um, there, there can, the way the uh, model is set up, we have uh, up to, um, uh, 10, uh, up to 20 uh, uh, possible uh, microbes per, per host. So the carrying capacity of the host is uh, 20. And if you start out with an initially uniform distribution of hologenotype frequencies, then through time, as you see, the, the entire population of holobionts comes to consist of those with a large number of uh, microbes in them, so a large microbiome. And you get exactly the opposite if it's parasitic. And the same thing with, with horizontal transmission. So if you start out with a, a Poisson distribution of uh, microbes per host, then through time, you see that the whole uh, distribution shifts to the right indicating that holobiont selection is leading to an increase in the number of uh, uh, microbes per, per host. So from this, I concluded that uh, holobiont selection is in fact effective regardless of whether the, the um, transmission was vertical or horizontal. And this, of course, would be puzzling to someone who would argue that holobiont evolution is impossible with horizontal selection. So what's going on here? And I, I think what's been uncovered is uh, an extended or mode of inheritance. So I've termed the distinction right here between collective versus lineal inheritance. And I think that's what underlies holobiont selection with horizontal transmission. So with normal uh, lineal inheritance right here, we have uh, a, uh, a holobiont, and the th this is and and its offspring whoops look exactly like it, um, and we're having lineal transmission here. And then here, for example, is a 
a holobiont that has parasites in it and it doesn't produce any offspring. So this would be the way it's selection on this kind of inheritance system, which would be the traditional way that evolution, that natural selection produces evolution. But there's with collective inheritance, it's more, more interesting, I think, uh, in that the organisms the, uh, which, which have uh, the favored genes or gene or organ um, or algae in them send contribute them all to a, a source pool here in the environment and then that source pool repopulates uh, the genomes in the next generation now the key point is that this is a selected subset of the parental genotypes or the parental hologenotypes that's the key thing it's a selected subset and then their genes go into this common pool. And it doesn't really matter from the standpoint of evolution whether or not the gene, uh, the genomes in, for each individual in the next generation come from a, a given ancestor or from a collection of common ancestors. It it's, doesn't matter. So that selection, repeated selection on s selected subsets of parental genotypes will wind up leading to uh, Darwinian evolution. I want to emphasize that it's Darwinian because uh, some of the early critics of holobiont evolution have in selection have suggested that it's not Darwinian, but it is. There's selection, there's inheritance, and at the species level, there's descent with modification. It's not Mendelian though. Uh, and so it's not consistent with uh, neo-Darwinism or the new synthesis, but it's definitely Darwinian and it's based on a selection process with an, an expanded view of inheritance. Now, the um, obvious limitation of the work up to this point is that it looks only at hologenotypes which differ in microbe number, not in microbe identity. So I continued this work uh, in, a in, a successive, in a subsequent paper looking at genetic identity. And there are two new assumptions that I've introduced here. One, in, in order to make the uh, subsequent work uh, attractable, I've introduced the assumption that the time scales differ uh, and that the, uh, let me go back here to this, that the time scales differ so that the within host microbial proliferation goes to completion. So here um, there's just one or two time or 10 time steps of microbe reproduction per host generation. What I've done subsequently has been to assume that this goes goes to the within host carrying capacity or the within host um, community equilibrium so that the the time step of the microbe is very short relative to the time step of the uh, host so that the within host microbial community comes to ecological equilibrium within the host before the next generation begins. The second thing is to assume that the second assumption is to assume that the microbial source pool is dilute so that uh, each host is colonized by only two microbes, which then go on to proliferate within it. Whereas my initial work involved assuming a, a general abundance within the uh, source pool. But it seems realistic to assume that the source pool is in fact dilute. So, uh, and now I'm focusing, of course, on horizontal transmission, because this seems to be the generic case, even though there's some, some vertical transmission of the microbiome. My reading of the literature uh, is that 95% or so of microbial transmission is horizontal. So here's where we have the 
a life cycle in which the initial, well, first of all, there, there are two, in this case, there are two microbial strains with horizontal transmission. Now, the, the logic of what I'm going to be showing you here is we'll start out with hol holobionts with two microbial strains. Then we'll look at holobionts with two nuclear gene, two different nuclear genes. And then we'll put them together where we have holobionts with genetic variation in the microbiome and in the nucleus together. So starting with two microbial strains, um, here they are in uh, green and brown. They, if there's only brown, it goes to uh, equilibrium at the carrying capacity of the host for this strain, similarly here. And if there are two strains, then there's a, an ecological equilibrium between N1 and N2 typically set in the modeling by the lock terra competition equations. So then this setup gives rise to uh, re releasing the, the, the algae into the uh, microbial source pool. Now we have two types of algae here. And now, and similarly, the hosts are released over here. And, and these are the number released depend on the fitnesses that are assigned to uh, um, to th to the microbes and uh, and and to the holobionts as a whole. And from this, we get uh, now we're getting binomial sampling rather than Poisson sampling. So if this is dilute enough, there'll only be uh, a couple. Uh, microbes that uh, colonize each host and and they would be uh, either so to speak homozygous heterozygous or homozygous for the microbe now i'm going to show you some equations uh, because i i'd like to draw out the analogy between uh, the hologenome and Tradition, a traditional genome. So what this will show here is uh, the typical equations for natural selection at one locus and two alleles that ho hopefully you've seen, but of course, don't. it's not on the tip of your tongue, I'm sure, uh, in your population genetics textbook. So if we have two alleles, A1 and A2, with this gene frequency, and this is the fitness for each of the genotypes, then this expression right here is the marginal fitness of allele one, which is P times W11 plus one minus P times W12. So this is the fitness of this allele in regardless of who it's paired with, averaged over who it's paired with. And similarly for this one. And the overall mean fitness is the average in turn of these. And this is the traditional equation for the gene frequency at time T plus one, given it at time T. Now, if W1 equals W2, if the marginal fitnesses are equal because of the whatever the P's are, then uh, the, if they're equal to one another, then they're also equal to this because the average of two equal numbers is the same as the number. So if these two are equal to one another, then uh, the numerator and the denominator cancel out to give you PT plus one equals PT, which indicates that equality of the mar marginal fitnesses is the criterion for population genetic equilibrium. So we can find our equilibrium gene frequencies by finding out the frequencies at which the two marginal uh, fitnesses are equal. And, um, uh, and so let's see how, it's, how it works out with uh, micro with microbes instead of uh, one locus and two alleles, and the derivation turns out to yield formulas that are almost the same as traditional population genetics. However, for the microbes, we need to define an effective fitness, which I've I've been terming a multi-level fitness. So it's so for this, this would be for the fitness for allele for microbe strain one in a host that's homozygous 
in, in, a, in a host. And so this would be K1, which is its within host fitness, its carrying capacity. And, and then W1 would be the fitness of the uh, host that has two um, strain one alleles in it. So we get this set of fitnesses right here, which are, um, which will then function in the, in the following equations, almost the same as the traditional ones do. Get, but as they say, they're multi, multi-level fitnesses. So you're basically getting K selection within host and R selection between hosts. And then you can then, in terms of these, you can define the the marginal fitness of strain one, the marginal fitness of strain two, and this would be the overall average fitness of a microbe. And then the frequency of the strains from one generation to the next is given by this equation, which is basically the same in appearance as the traditional one. And the uh, equilibrium will be when the marginal fitness of the two strains is the same. So you can see that here, um, this is the frequency of strain one versus time. And this is the microbe marginal fitness equality. When they're equal is uh, where the uh, peak is. And if they're not equal, then uh, uh, they're off the peak. So this would be the predicted point at which the equilibrium should occur at this micro frequency. And that's here. And from different initial conditions, by golly, uh, the microbe uh, frequency uh, uh, equilibrates. Now, turning to two host alleles with vertical trans, uh, with uh, vertical transmission of the host alleles, what happens is that uh, we have um, hosts that can have nuclear genes, in this case, a homozygote, a heterozygote, and so forth. They, again, the microbes come to equilibrium uh, with these different uh, genes in them. And then, and this, and then the uh, the hosts reproduce because they're diploid, but they reproduce through random mating, a random union of gametes, and we have a host gamete pool. And then the hosts reproduce, uh, the, the, and then these hosts reproduce, giving rise to uh, a genetic distribution of juvenile hosts, which are in, then colonized by a microbial source pool. In this case, they're all, all the microbes are all the same because we're just looking at host alleles variation. So this would be just the application of standard one locus to allele population genetics. And these are, I've repeated here, these formulas for you. And as you would expect from traditional genetics, we have uh, an allele marginal fitness equality of, of, of allele one. And uh, this then is where fitness equality occurs. And that corresponds to the equilibrium. Now the plot thickens. Uh, we have both uh, host alleles transmitting vertically, but the microbial strains are transmitting horizontally. And it gets a little complicated, but the logic of it is really quite similar. So again, we start out with uh, hosts with, that have just been colonized, that we get micro, a microbial community at equilibrium. There are different kinds of microbial communities that occur depending on the strains involved and the host alleles. And then we get a selection of, of the pair. And so now we have the, the microbial source pools populated with microbes, the host gamete pool with nuclear genes, and then these are reassembled. And the random union of gametes simply occurs through the Hardy-Weinberg ratios. And 
the microbial sa binomial sampling occurs through ratios that actually are similar to the Hardy-Weinberg ratios. And you wind up getting a lot of different hologenotypes being possible right here. These, these are uh, nine different hologenotypes and, and that gives rise to quite a lot of these marginal fitnesses. So these, for example, would be the marginal fitness of strain one, the marginal fitness of strain two, but it's averaged over the different nuclear backgrounds that uh, the strain might encounter. And similarly, this is the uh, this is the marginal fitness of a host with allele one, averaged over the different micro my, microbiomes that it can face, and then that's it. It's uh, fitness. And then you come out with a pair of simultaneous equations for uh, the microbe composition and the nuclear composition. And so, so now we're dealing with uh, a system. Let me come back to this and talk about this a little bit, because one of the things that's very nice about this diagram is it shows the logical um, a similarity between the microbial source pool and the host gamete pool. These are logical counterparts of each other, uh, where this one refers to the nuclear genes and this to the microbial genes. And the setup is somewhat analogous to a two locus system right here, in which we get um, uh, Two, two, uh, two alleles on, uh, in different loci and perhaps on the same chromosome or different chromosomes. In any case, you have the outcome of uh, the simultaneous evolution of uh, the microbiome and the host. Is you, you get a two-dimensional diagram here with the allele one and strain one. These are the boundary equilibria right here in which strain one is absent. This is all strain two. Allele one is absent. So this is all allele one. And this up in this corner is uh, a holo, holo gene pool uh, configuration in which it's all strain one and all allele one. And these little dots right here represent places where um, there are so-called boundary equilibria. And there are easy formula that you can derive for the conditions for the boundary equilibria to be unstable. Now, if all the boundary equilibria are unstable, it means the trajectories are leading into the middle in which you're getting a polymorphism both in the nucleus and in the um, microbiome simultaneously. And it turns out the formula for this is also easy to write down, uh, but, you, you, uh, but you do need to in any particular case, solve for it numerically. And here's a, a picture of the uh, uh, trajectories. So if, you, so if the distribution of holobionts across the population starts out here, they wind up at this point right here. And so you get a stable uh, equilibrium of both the of both the microbiome and the host, you're getting. And there's also a counterpart of the idea as to what's being, uh, of uh, the maximization of uh, uh, fitness, uh, marginal fitness equalities. So this is a, a surface right here of the product of the uh, marginal fitness inequalities. and. Uh, they come to zero. The, the peak right here is where the marginal fitnesses of both allele types in the nucleus and both strain types in the uh, microbiome are equal. And trajectories shown by these uh, blue dots here uh, come right to the peak. This is a view of the surface from underneath. This is from above. Now, I'd like to note, though, that the mean holobiont fitness is not maximized by holobiont selection. 
And this is also reminiscent of two locus theory in which uh, the mean population fitness is generally not maximized at uh, a two locus equilibrium. And so the, the highest fitness, mean holobiont fitness would be highest up here. And that's in fact where the equilibrium is, which you see from below. So uh, this shows that you really can work out uh, the simultaneous evolution of uh, the uh, host and its microbiome. Now, one other thing uh, which I've worked on is the issue of whether there's a uh, an equivalent of the evolutionary stable strategy which would apply to holobionts. And the reason for this is that the kind of population genetic modeling I've just been showing you really presupposes that you have two, two known alleles, and two known strains and so forth. And you might not have that much detail, of course, and it'd be nice to speak more about the phenotype and the virtue of the evolutionary stable strategy is a strategy is a phenotype. And so, so with a population genetic foundation, you compute what an optimal strategy is. And you can do that here as well. Um, you can take a, an equilibrium point like this one, where uh, it's all strain one and all allele one, and ask what phenot and assign that to a phenotype. Say, say some phenotype has that uh, uh, genetic and microbial composition associated with it and ask what phenotype would be not invadable by any other um, uh, strategy, by, by any other combination of microbe and allele. And if this equilibrium is not, if the strategy assigned to this equilibrium is not invadable by a strategy, any other strategy, which is given some other genetic basis, then this would be stable, a holostable strategy. And you can compute that. Um, so these are, happen to be the conditions for this to be stable. And what you do then is you introduce a phenotype model in this case for the host, and X stands for the altruistic effort expressed by a host to the microbe. And Y is the altruistic effort expressed by the microbe to the host. And then this shows, for example, that uh, if the host expresses altruistic effort, it debits from its baseline fitness, but it also receives something from what's contributed by the uh, microbe. And here's the microbe's base carrying capacity, which it gives, gives up in order to get uh, some, uh, some return from the host. And then you then compute what's the optimal amount of altruistic effort each party should give to the other. And so th these are the formulas right here. And I've uh, in the paper develop some numerical examples of this. So you can also use this theory uh, with its uh, with with phenotypes uh, by taking advantage of the notion of an opt of a holostable strategy, which would be an optimal holo holobiont configuration. So uh, one thing that the holobiont selection raises is that it's a, a kind of multi-level selection. And the population genetic literature has a taxonomy of multi-level multi selection types. Um, and uh, this has been discussed uh, for some time now over the years. And multi-level selection type one is given by this kind of picture. And this, the person who worked on this a lot was Maynard Smith, who, who introduced the idea, and that's why it's called the haystack model. He introduced a model in which particles or mice uh, 
lid in a haystack, which is what the border is right here. And the green mice, <laughs> the, the green particles, uh, are by, by assumption cooperative. And so they make a lot more mice. But the brown mice right here fight with each other all the time. So they don't make any mice. But in any case, the mice that are made uh, go out into a pool of dis a dispersal pool of little mice, and they then colonize all the empty uh, uh, haystacks uh, one generation later. So the haystacks provide uh, an environment or a context within which cooperation can occur, and and the cooperation then leads to uh, increasing the cooperative genes in the dispersal pool which then starts to flood and they flood the dispersal pool, dispersal pool which then um, uh, um, colonizes the new state, new haystacks the next year. Now, th so this is a horizontal transmission kind of process, but there's no evolution of the haystack. So the haystack simply provides a physical context within which the uh, um, the selection for the altruist can occur. Now, MLS type 2 is one in which the, uh, the particles and the host uh, reproduce as a unit. And um, so here you have uh, a, uh, a one kind of particle in one kind of host. And this is the, the selfish particle in a different host. And, and because of the cooperation in this host, this, this host together with its particles reproduces as a whole. And, they re and so this represents vertical transmission. Now, holobiont um, evolution is sort of a combination of both of these. And I've taken the liberty of calling this MLS type three. MLS stands for multi-level selection. And that's because we have the horizontal transmission of the particles, but we're also getting the evolution of the host. And so in this case, we're getting some hosts that also pick up uh, the uh, particles as well, because there could also be some hosts that uh, had some, some green particles in them. In any case, uh, we're getting really uh, a, a combination of elements of both type one and type two. And type and holobiont evolution can't be reduced to just one or the other, uh, at least with horizontal transmission. Um, and so uh, that's why it seems to me we're going to need to increase the taxonomy by one. Okay, so the conclusions are that uh, the hologenotype is a hierarchical data structure. Holobiont selection theory maps hologenotype distribution at t to t plus one. That's what the theory does. That's the definition of it. Holobiont selection produces evolution. It works with both vertical and horizontal microbial transmission. And horizontal and holobiont selection with vertical transmission involve uh, amounts to lineal inheritance of the microbiome, and with horizontal transmission, amounts to collective inheritance of the microbiome, Co a collective inheritance from a selected subset of parents. And then, and that's contained in the, these are conclusions from the first of the two papers I'll, I'll be citing. Then the conclusion from the second paper is that the random colonization by microbes is a colon is, is a counterpart of the random union of gametes. And then multi-level fit, fitness for microbes combines within host K selection and between host R selection. And hologenome theory is analogous to two locus, a two locus genetic system. And host microbiome co-adaptation may may represent a holostable strategy. And finally, from this paper, holobiont selection with vertical transmission corresponds to MLS2 and with horizontal 
transmission to MLS3. And MLS3 combines elements of MLS1 and MLS2. And then the sort of meta conclusions are that holo, the holo genome with holo variant selection can be made evolutionarily rigorous. And holo variant theory is useful because it considers both host and microbiome simultaneously. And holobionts do not holobionts do not destabilize individuality. And the reference here is there's a lot of discussion among philosophers, especially, as to whether the concept of the holobiont means that the notion of a biological individual uh, is no longer valid. Um, but I don't think that's a problem. I, I think the individuality of the holobiont derives from the individuality of the host. And uh, a coral, let's say a solitary coral, uh, is a holobiont uh, with or without a microbiome within it. And its status as an individual reflects the fact that it's a solitary coral rather than that it has a microbiome in it. And what's problematic about colonial uh, corals from the standpoint of individuality is that they're colonial, not that they have a microbiome in them. Whereas I do think from, from philosophically, if you will, that holo, holobionts with horizontal transmission do destabilize our understanding of inheritance as it pertains to evolution by replacing lineal inheritance with collective inheritance. I think this is the most uh, philosophically challenging aspect of holobiont selection theory. So these are the uh, papers I've been referring to right here. Uh, the, the one uh, about vertical versus horizontal transmission is in philosophy, theory, and practice in biology. This is an open access um, paper. And then the, uh, the work with two strains of microbes and two loci is in bioarchive. So, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I hope that was uh, um, uh, intelligible. Thank you so much, Joan. I really appreciate that talk. And I think you did a wonderful job of creating visuals that go along and clearly explain some fairly complicated mathematical equations. So thank you so much.